All right, Todd, you should. Fixed gas detection equipment, and we're located uh, right here in St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, we're going to cover today uh, some listed gas detection for sewage collection and treatment facilities, and more specifically, compliance with NFPA 820. So in the US, we have over 16,000 municipal waste treatment systems. Um, each of these systems have regulatory uh, requirements for environmental and safety uh, to preserve the quality of life and also the environment. Process hazards exist, such as O2 deficiency, uh, many different toxic gases, and again, uh, fire and explosion hazards in many of the different applications. Here's just a list of uh, a lot of the different gases that you'll see present in these systems, being the transmission systems or the plants themselves. Um, some of the more common ones are going to be ammonia, uh, chlorine gas, uh, H2S, uh, methanol, methane, natural gas, uh, sewer gas, which consists of or sludge gas, uh, methane, and CO2. Uh, these are kind of the more um, you know common gases you'll see and uh, collection areas, uh, digesters, uh, storage areas, uh, different things. And we'll cover some of these applications in more detail. Uh, as Ryan said, please feel free to um, ask questions. We'll have a, a point where we can stop and, and discuss some of these if, in a little more detail if wanted to, what we'd be doing there and the different things, uh, different hazards and, and different applications where we can meet uh, these demands. I've been on compliance, obviously the, the compliance is the act or process of complying with and following a demand, a code, regulation or standard or law. Municipalities, cities, states uh, all adopt these codes and regulations into law as well as write their own regulations that they must follow. Um, all entities though must comply with federal laws. Non-compliance can uh, result in you know, heavy fines, um, injury or even death. Uh, so these are uh, these laws are put into enacted uh, to obviously protect the environment, but also uh, protect the the workers at the plants, um, the the environment around the plants. Um, you had a chlorine gas leak or something like that. Could you know? I've I've been in some plants where their chlorine gas storage is right next to a neighborhood. Um, so these these laws are in place to to protect not only the the plant operations people, but also the the surrounding environment and the people in those areas. So they're very important, obviously. Um, 40 CFR, or CFR stands for Code of Federal, Federal Regulation, is the EPA. Um, there are consensus codes, of course, that follow for mechanical, uh, basic electrical, plumbing, and building codes, things like that. Um, OSHA, obviously, for uh, the health and safety of the employees. And then NFPA standards, and we list a bunch of them here, but the one we're going to focus the majority of our time on here is going to be uh, NFPA 20. Um, NFPA 820 is the standard for fire protection and wastewater treatment and collection facilities. Um, chapter 7 of that standard, uh, specifically Chapter 7.4, is NFPA uh, 820, and it details requirements and placement of combustible gas detectors. Um, chapters 4, 5, and 6, and tables 4.2, 5.2, and 6.2. Um, it designates the the, uh, the locations, um, the different uh, codes that are uh, applicable there, alarm set points. And I wanted to show that code just quickly here. I'll pull that over and expand that. This is actually Chapter 7 in the FPA standard. Um, uh, you can get this, you can download this for free from the internet. Um, you can buy it from NFPA. Um, but these tables, these 4.2, 5.2, and 6.2 tables, they list all the different collection systems, the location and the function of that system, the fire and explosion hazard, ventilation, whether it's required or not. And you'll see these codes here. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, extent of the classified area. A lot of questions come up about, well, is that area classified? It's all right here in NFPA A20. Um, the NEC codes, uh, what the classification level would be, and they'll list all that. Material construction of the buildings and structures, um, maybe not as important, but if you're, unless you're building one, I suppose. And then the fire protection measures needed. Um, you'll see here, this is the one we're focusing on being a gas detection manufacturer, is, uh, is the combustible gas detection if enclosed. So you'll see the C 
GD designation throughout here and some other areas, it'll say if enclosed or you know whether the condition might be the measures needed. So the example I'm, I've showed here is uh, it goes through many different examples, as you can see. Um, so it covers just about every process within a plant or trans, um, transmission uh, uh, line of, of you know, where you're going to be a collection of the, uh, the sewage and different things. Um, this one is the stormwater pumping station, wet wells, it's the liquid side of the pumping station serving only the storm sewer system. So it's very specific and where, you know, where we're, this one's for storm sewer, industrial sewer, and so on. Um, the fire hazard, uh, you know, possible ignition or flammable gases of floating flammable liquids. Um, NNW stands for ventilation is not normally ventilated, so it gives you that. And right down on the bottom of each one of these pages, all the different, um, is a legend for all the different codes. So NNN, NNV, not normally ventilated, uh, CGD, combustible gas detection system, and so on. Um, <clears throat> the extent of the classified area, so entire room or space, if this is enclosed, it's going to tell you the entire room or space. And this is the Div 2, Class 1, Div 2 area. And then, of course, the building material codes here. Um, sorry, one second. Okay, so that's kind of NFPA 20, uh, the standard itself. You can get this online, uh, just download that as a PDF format, and print it out. Then you can use all these tables to, um, to guide you in your uh, selection and placement of the different um, sensors and whatever you might need. And this is also not just for uh, gas detection, but so also for flammability uh, and ventilation. So there's a lot of wealth of information there. If you ever have any questions about that, this is a great reference material uh, and will give you, um, you know, everything you need there. And as well, I have a copy. So if anybody wants to provide their email address, I'd be happy to forward that uh, on as well. Okay. Any discussion on it? Anything you, uh, any questions uh, where to obtain that? Um, anything you want to open the floor up to? Brian, any questions? Yeah, Todd. Uh, no questions so far, but but do you want to maybe mention if if a customer comes to us with a question on uh, you know on on whether they need certain sensors or gas detectors in in a wet well or a specific area? I mean, we can we can help. Yeah, so we can we can also be your resource for guidance and and deciding the not only the selection of the sensor. Uh, and we follow these codes just like anybody else would. Um, we're we're not, you know, we're not a certified uh, engineering firm that's going to do a, a site survey and all that sort of thing. We leave that up to the customer to make those determinations. But we will give you general guidance of where to place the sensor. Um, it's all based on the density of the gas, how the what levels you want to place the sensor at. You know, whether if it's O2, you want to put it in the breathing zone. If it's methane, you're going to put it up higher because it's a lighter uh, lighter gas. So. The, these are all things that we can definitely help you uh, guide you in, in selecting and installing uh, the sensors, the different transmitters, and we'll talk more about the transmitters that are available, available and which one would be maybe best fit for your application. Uh, we'll go through some applications here as we go through the presentation, but certainly we can uh, definitely help you with that. And we do have other resources that we can um, bring in to uh, do your, your design and layouts as well, if that were something that you wanted to to get help with and, and go into uh, maybe a larger project uh, where you needed to get um, you know, some some more definitive and you know following the laws and that sort of thing we can we can help you with that as well and todd we, we did just have a question come in um the, the question asks what about a sewage wet well is this a div 2 area yeah so i believe that was what we did the example we were just showing was a sewage wet well um let me try and get back to that if I can. As you can see, there's there's a lot of different um, areas here that we would uh, look at, but I think that was a div two on the sewage wet well. Um, if I can find where my code, where are we at? Chapter four two. This should be the section here. Um, residential wastewater pumping station dry well. So here's a wet well pumping station wet well. It's showing as a div div two. Um, yeah, stormwater pumping station, stormwater. These are all it, it most likely div two um, because you're going to have the presence of methane. Maybe not all the time, but there is a, a risk of that, so it would be div two. 
If it were div one, it would mean you have an explosible gas present all the time. I hope that answers the question for you. Yep. All right. So some of the common applications um, we'll see, obviously, pumping stations, uh, primary sedimentation, sedimentation, grit removal, screening. Those are those are obviously areas you'd want to monitor for methane, O2, H2S. Clarifiers, some cases uh, you'll see clarifiers. A lot of times these are open, so you wouldn't really need a whole lot of um, uh, detection here, but that could be a, um, an area. Um, obviously, head works, um, bar screening areas, sludge treatment, uh, digester buildings for certain if they're enclosed, and so on. Um, just some examples of lift stations. Lift stations come in many different sizes, shapes, and variables. Some will have human entry, some won't, mostly probably don't unless they're very large lift stations, other than maybe a ladder to go down into the well to service pumps and things like that. Uh, these can be storm or sanitary or combined. Um, and um, you always want to monitor for LEL because of the methane gas. And, and some may have some ventilation, if that's possible as well. Uh, and some you might, might want to monitor those surrounding areas because you have, uh, in this, this example here, you have the, uh, the vents. So if there was some issues with like a surrounding neighborhood or something where you want to make sure that this was not uh, presenting problem, you could monitor for that. But here's a, an example or a picture of a small residential lift station. Um, no real provisions for entry. Uh, we would mount the sensor remotely from the transmitter into the wet well. This is one way of doing it. Obviously, there's some there's some uh, hazards introduced here, you know, in the operation of the sensor because it is in this you know, moist um, environment, you know, a lot of corrosive gases and things like that. Um, but it is one way of doing it with remotely mounting it. Uh, we would put the transmitter then out here on the control panel. Um, methane, obviously, like I said, is the concern. We can use an IS sensor. These sensors are all IS. So there's, um, when they're in the wet well, there's no uh, risk of explosion from the sensor. Uh, and then um, in this, this scenario, there's no active ventilation. Larger lift stations, the same kind of thing. And there could be uh, provisions for entry, may not be, but they might have more buildings. And you might want to monitor for the buildings in these areas. Um, this here is showing a kind of an all-one transmitter. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but this has, you know, enunciation built into it, um, the control or, um, you know, the, the human interface here, and also then the remote mount transmitter in the well itself. Another way to monitor these using the same transmitters, but without having the sensor present in the well, is the sample draw system. Um, this gives us the ability not only to not have these sensors down in the that nasty environment, but we can pull a sample from the environment, um, use a coalescer filter to filter the gas as it comes in, remove the moisture from it. That also, what that does is gives our sensors the ability to have a longer life because we're not exposing to a lot of moisture, which could cause the life of the sensor to degrade. Um, and then we can monitor for multiple gases in one area. So we can have one tap going into the well, coming through the sample draw system, passing that gas across these three sensors and getting your alarm relays out of that, these three sensors. Uh, you can see which gas is alarming by the faceplate, which will tell you the PPM levels or LEL levels of the gas that it's alarming on or sensing. And then you would vent that to the atmosphere obviously in a safe location. Um, again, larger wet wells, human entry here. Um, sensors, the, this obviously is stairs, so people can be down in here. And this is all about the sensor placement, your hydrocarbon sensors here, your H2S and O2 sensors, more in your breathing levels where your human uh, people will be. And then the upper levels for your explosives or the methane gases. Um, yeah, just one quick question. One, comment on communications. This, and I'll cover this a little bit more when we talk about the products a little bit more, but these all can have 420 milliamp output, they can have relay output, and then we can bring these back into a controller. So it can be really a standalone safety system as well. We also have our S485 Modbus. Don't see these a lot in Florida, but you run across them here and there, but you can also come into some tunnels. Tunnels should always be monitored, underground tunnels containing natural gas or sludge gas piping. Um, any of this, any of these pipings and a lot of stuff can leak. If you're having people go in here to do your maintenance and service in these areas, these are definitely a place where you'll want to, to um, 
obviously monitor for explosives and, and hazardous or toxic gases. Cogeneration, um, you're going to have the it's a biogas recovery or gas and conditioning areas and monitoring. You might have an SCR with a selected catalytic recovery unit, which would be um, would be scrubbing the gas and uh, that would also produce or uses ammonia for that. So you would want to monitor for ammonia in these situations. Um, you'll have uh, these, you'll see a lot. In, so not so much again in Florida. This is really, really big out in California where they're very, um, you know, capturing every bit of energy that they can and, and reduce the emissions. They're taking that uh, digester gas, they're, they're cleaning it up, and they're running these generators either to produce power or I've also seen it where they are using it to uh, produce heat, fire boilers, things like that. Um, screening and grit removal areas. Uh, that lift station screening, you're going to monitor for O2 again in the breathing level, H2S, and then methane or LEL. And we can do remote mounting here. We can have, if this were a smaller room or you had an entry close by here, we could monitor remotely with the sensors and then put the transmitter, be it an all one with the, the enunciation or a transmitter that goes back to a control panel of some sort with some kind of local enunciation, we could put that on the outside of the room. So as a employees are entering the room, the hazards are known in the room before they enter. Digester areas, digester buildings, um, gas processing, gas storage, uh, you know, anything that's enclosed and around this, the, these sort of environments, you're going to want to monitor for, again, O2, H2S, and LEL. See a common theme here. These are kind of the, the basic, you know, three that we're monitoring for in these in these areas where the sludge is producing this this biohazard gas. Um, denitrification, don't see a whole lot of applications here, but you would want to monitor obviously for ammonia levels, uh, different things like that. Um, and then a bit on methanol. Methanol is also uh, had a toxicity level of 200 ppm in an eight hour workday. So time weighted average, this is an OSHA standard. And it also has a flammability of 6% LEL, 6% volume LEL. And LEL stands for lower explosive limit for anybody that was wondering what LEL means. I should have said that earlier, but LEL is just, you know, your lower limits of when that can become a hazard of exploding. Preferred detection method is going to be 0 to 500 ppm with electrochemical sensor and your LEL is going to be infrared uh, IR sensor. Dry wells, again, same kind of thing as the pump, uh, wet well. Pumping stations, uh, below grade, same hazards. Um, could be positively pressurized, but if you know if not, um, you know, we want to monitor for all those things. Uh, again, lots of uh, lots of opportunities for employees to enter into these hazards, and you want to keep your employees safe by monitoring for these gases. Disinfecting, obviously, chlorine and bleach is a, is a major hazard in these rooms where we have all these storage of different chemicals. Um, SO2 could be used for dechlorination, uh, bleach and chlorine, um, you know, H2S. These are all, this is a, a great area to make sure that you're getting your, your monitoring for these, again, for the safety of your, uh, your workers at, at the plant. Any, uh, any discussions on, uh, on the applications, anything that maybe you want to dive into a little bit more? Yeah, we got a couple of questions that came up, Todd. So I think the first one relates to, um, back to the the wet wells and the pumping stations um the the question is that you offer a remote sensor that does not require a poured seal uh will that work in in these div 2 areas in the div 2 area you you can again i'm not your i'm not your classification expert these are things that you want to consult with engineers on to make sure you're doing the right things but we do offer this remote mounting kit as a class 1 div 1 area with poured connections. Um, the sensor itself is IS, um, so that in a class two area, you shouldn't need all that extra, but we do offer it if, if it was a, of a concern. Um, it's not that much more money than the regular remote mount kit, so it's probably just a good practice uh, if there even is a, a, a chance of that being an issue. And then there was a question about um, the NFPA code uh the the version that you pulled up is is from 2008 do you know if that's the the most recent version of of nfpa 820 or if there's newer versions available online i don't know the answer i think that that's 
Uh, I don't know. I would have to get a, a clarification on that from NFPA. This is the one I found when I was looking for this as using an example. Um, I'm sure that they update these periodically. I don't think, in my, in my experience, these applications haven't changed much over the years. And so these, these specifications wouldn't change much either. Um, but I'm sure there is a, a more current uh, publication and we can, we can search and treat, I can get a hold of the FDA and find out what that is. Um, but I don't, I don't anticipate there'd be a lot of differences there, but certainly would be best to have the most current uh, publication uh, for your, your uses in the plant. And then um, another question as it relates to the, to the wet wells with that sample draw system, you, you yeah. can use that sample draw system to pull out of a div one or div two environment, correct? Yeah, I'll, I'll cover that a little bit more, but you, you can you can pull, you can draw from a class one div one area, and the, the sample draw itself is class uh, one div two certified. Okay, and then a uh, question about calibration. How often do do you need to calibrate the sensors? So that that's a very subjective question. We recommend you know no more than quarterly, um, but it is dependent upon your maintenance um, um, setups and how you it really depends upon the environment the sensor's in. If you've got it in a wet well, you should be calibrating that more frequently. If you've got it in a controlled environment, like a lab environment, where there could be a hazard of some gases every once in a while, and the sensor is just not seeing the target gas on a regular basis, depending upon your experience when you're doing your calibrations and, and how often you have to do them to keep the sensor uh, current and, and working properly, you can write your procedures you know, to be uh, out there further say six months you know even a year we don't recommend that quarterly is what we would we would recommend um but uh but it does it does all depend upon your safety systems uh and your processes that you put into place uh for these these areas but just keep in mind the environment really dictates how much you should be um calibrating these the worse the environment the more the calibration should be performed to make sure that the sensor is working at its optimal condition um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more too, but we do have on our, our sense alert ASI, we do have a predictive end of life on those. Um, so you can actually also see that, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more and gives you an idea of how long these sensors are lasting in an environment. Okay, and then uh, Sean Gilson and, and Suvath clarified for us, there is a current edition of, of NFPA 820 for this current year, 2020. So that is available. Right. Yeah, so they, they probably update that annually and I just grabbed the first one I found online because like I said, it, it's probably not a, a major changes in there, but it's definitely recommended to have the most current edition. edition. So so one final case, question. We, we have to buy it. <laughs> one final question that we've got here, Todd, um, and I don't know if you'll cover this on a slide at all, but uh, as it relates to um, odor detection or scrubber applications, do you, do you talk at all about about doing scrubbers? I do not. Um, uh, and I, un unfortunately, I don't have a lot of background on that. Sean, maybe, and um, Ryan, maybe you can help out answer that question. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So so we do uh, we do scrubber detectors all the time. Uh, most common one we see in, in wastewater is gonna be scrubbing out H2S. So typically when we do that, we'll have a, uh, a transmitter on the inlet of the scrubber and a transmitter on the outlet of the scrubber. Typically, your inlet sensor is going to be a higher range, maybe a, a hundred uh, ppm H2S, and your outlet sensor is going to be a, a lower range, 10 ppm H2S. And we're just making sure that that scrubber is working efficiently. Over time, as the uh, efficiency of that scrubber decreases, it'll let you know that you need to swap out the um, the, the filter media inside that scrubber, and we offer a duct mount kit that will allow us to mount those sensors directly in the duct coming into and out of that scrubber or we can use the sample draw like todd showed earlier and we can pull a sample out of the the duct work and bring it to our sensor thanks ryan yep all right back to you todd all right all right so who is sensodyne uh, as i said we're a manufacturing facility we established in 1983 and acquired by the Schaumburg Group in April of 2008. A multinational company with 37 locations worldwide um, and um, where the Cincinnati is the instrumentation hub for the Americas. 
Uh, we expanded to a brand new facility uh, in January of 13, and we are an ISO 9001 certified facility. Facility, and, and we do a lot of ongoing investments in product development and sustaining engineering. Uh, a typical um, system you'll see this obviously is quite a few points, but you'll you'll have your gas detectors throughout the facility. As a rule, most of our customers keep their safety systems separate from their control systems. So we do offer controllers that can do uh, that can accomplish that for you, um, which will feed back into your fire panels or even your uh, your control systems. But as a rule, the, these are somewhat separate with just communications back into other systems. And then those can then communicate to your enunciation panels for um, for your alarms and, and strobes and horns and different things like that. It's kind of the family of products. Um, these are the, the most recent, uh, Sense Alert ASI and Sense Air. Uh, the Sense Alert ASI is our kind of Cadillac features and benefits rich uh, product that we offer, whereas since there, um, a little more lower cost, but still very robust, um, uh, feature rich uh, for the price. It's a great uh, option for us. We have a sense flex if we want to do some dual range, uh, a dual gas sensing, uh, sense cast for wireless. These are sort of legacy products you may have around your plant. Uh, we still support them, um, but they are uh, being phased out. So you have your sense alert plus and your sense alert. And then the Sense Alarm Plus is our all-in-one kind of standalone unit uh, with built-in enunciation and, and large digital readout. So as I said, the, the Sense Alert ASI is our preferred transmitter for all new applications. It is still too certified, uh, FM approved, uh, and replacing the Sense Alert Plus. So if you have some Sense Alert Plus in here, this is your next, next generation of the uh, instrument. Um, the, it is remote mountable, like we discussed with the sensor, up to 100 feet away from the transmitter. Uh, configurable enclosure orientation. So if you have an orientation where your connections are either on a horizontal or vertical plane, uh, we can orientate that. So for existing in installations, we can accommodate that as well. Basic models for class one, div one and div two and IS. Um, different enclosure materials, we can do this in stainless if we needed to. Not, don't see that a whole lot in water wastewater, but it is available. Stainless steel sensor housing, stainless steel um, transmitter housings, or even PVC and different plastics. Um, like I said, lots of features and benefits in different configurations we can get into with this. The Sense Alert ASI, this is actually a screenshot of the, the faceplate here. And it's got a lot of data that we display here. Uh, gas concentration, gas type, and maximum sensor range, local date and time, transmitter ID number that the user inputs into that. Um, uh, acknowledge switches, uh, go back and up and down arrows. The up and down and knowledge is all controlled by a non-intrusive magnetic wand. So these, these screw points here are actually magnetic um, switch points. You have your acknowledgement, you go back, and you're up and down to navigate through the menus. Every time you wand over one of these, you'll see this little LED light will come on to acknowledge that you have triggered that switch. Real simple when it comes to doing calibrations. This is the complete calibration process for doing a calibration with the Sense Alert ASI. Everything is in plain English. You enter the main menu mode, and you'll see right there, you've got your calibration mode, your maintenance mode, data review, and so on. Uh, to do a calibration, we, we would acknowledge your calibration mode. We would do, uh, it'll display your last calibration, as well as three other uh, the three previous calibrations. So you actually can display four historical calibrations with this unit right in the transmitter. And all that data is actually stored on the sensor. So the transmitter is just reading the sensor. The sensor is what we call a smart sensor. And all this data, the calibration, the gas concentrations, the predictive end of life, all those algorithms are based in the transmitter itself, excuse me, in the sensor itself. Transmitter is doing nothing more than navigating the the the, uh, the firmware within the sensor, so that makes the sensor very portable, right? We'll we'll discuss why that's important a little bit more uh, here in a minute. So then we would go and set our uh, cal our gas uh, concentration, cal gas concentration. In this case, we're calibrating a 50 ppm sensor. We want to calibrate to 50% of the range, which would be a 25 ppm gas concentration. And then the next thing, the next part of that menu is where it says calibrate, you would acknowledge that, and it tells you apply gas now. Once you apply the gas and it's in this mode, it's now in the calibration mode, it goes through the calibration process itself, 
uh, once the calibration is complete, it'll give you an OK, pass or fail at 50 ppm, and then tells you to remove the gas and select acknowledge to complete. And that's it, you're done. It takes a few minutes. Um, basically, just gotta go through three menu setups, uh, three menu steps, I should say. Apply your gas, turn your gas off, and you're ready to go. Um, as I discussed earlier, we have also this predictive sensor failure. What this does is allow the user to uh, define within 30 days of the sensor life expiration. And actually, you can find it down to less than that if you wanted to, but 30 days is a good rule of thumb. Um, it eliminates downtime uh, and then enables preventative maintenance. Um, so what this is looking at is an algorithm that looks at the elapsed time of the sensor has been on, the accumulated exposure to the target gas, uh, the gain adjustment or gain factors, uh, which are changed every time you do a calibration, and then the power on hours. So um, it takes that all into consideration and gives you a predictive end of life of the sensor. You can also tie this into a relay output um, so you can alert your operators in the control room or in your safety system that this is, uh, this is a sensor that is going to be failing soon and will enable you to order a new sensor and that way you have no downtime of your safety systems, which obviously is very important. Our Sense Alarm Plus is a complete gas detection system, standalone, single point, AC or DC powered, um, a double flash, you can have a low level alarm or a, um, a high level alarm both in, in there and also has an audible horn uh, built into it as well. These can be remote mounted up to 100 feet away as we discussed and uh, are really good for uh, placing an entry to a room where you might have some exposure to low oxygen. Uh, you could have a, a, customer, a, a worker walk into a low oxygen environment and, and drop dead right there and, and never knew what hit them. This way they're not walking into those environments into a hazardous location. Um, it's being monitored. They got the security of knowing that this is a, a safe location before entering the building or space. And again, the Sense Air, this is a uh, trying to break the you get what you pay for mold. Uh, it's a basic unit, but it's very robust. Um, it, it, it has 28 different sensor options for toxic O2 and combustible gases. And you're around the $1,000 range on this. This is a very economical uh, transmitter and sensor package. You can remote mount the sensor. It does have relays, 4 to 20 milliamp output and back net if that was something you were using as well as Modbus options. So lots of options, lots of benefits and features at a very uh, competitive price. Uh, you'll see this is this is the low end. Typically on the higher end ASIs, you're looking at say 1700 plus a sensor, maybe two, $2,000, dollars You know, this is this is a, a great little unit. It will meet most of the applications you have in your facilities and do it at a very competitive price. As I said, we offer a number of different controllers. Not gonna go deep into this, but the Sense Alert is our four channel controller that has uh, enunciation on the panel as well as visual indications of the gas concentration. Or you have a full featured graphical display with 64 inputs with the model 7200 that's listed in the lower right hand corner. Um, so we can, we can do the whole package of controller, transmitter, enunciation. Um, we have options for remote enunciation as well. Um, we can get into all those different things and, and set up your entire safety uh, system if needed. We discussed this a little bit already, but this is our sample draw system. And a little background on, on Sensodyne. We're also a air sampling pump manufacturer. And I, I, last I knew, we, we own about 80% of the market of the air sampling pump market. And actually, right now we're in the process of making um, taking those same pumps go into the ventilators uh, for hospitals. So we obviously are very busy making ventilators for hospitals right now. Um, but those pumps are very uh, robust, uh, tried and true over time, many, many million hours of cycle time and all that. And we've taken that technology and incorporated it into our sample draw system. So we have a very robust system that, um, that will operate, give you years of service. And as we said, it's a class one div two rated for sampling from a class one div one area. Um, listed for NFPA 20 compliance, so that's important as well. And we also can do this in aspirated versions if that were a requirement. Um, kind of already went over this, but same kind of thing. You, know, you can pass this across multiple sensors, draw from a single point, condition or filter your uh, sample um, so that you're uh, prolonging the life of your sensors and different things. So as I said, all the, uh, the sensors are 
portable. Uh, this gives us the ability to do um, calibrations either in a, in a controlled environment like a like the maintenance shop. Uh, you can have a spare transmitter there to do calibrations remotely, and then go back and put the sensor, uh, exchange the sensor in the field. That way, you're not doing it out in the field in the heat, the moisture, and the uh, different things that affect the calibration, as well as uh, you know the employees' safety and and comfort. Um, we also offer a sensor calibration exchange program, whereas we you would you would purchase two sensors up front. We would store one of the sensors in our controlled environment in the factory. Um, as the the preset time comes to when you you're going to do a calibration swap uh, or sensor exchange, we would calibrate, recondition the sensor, send that to you. You take the sensor, you pull it out of the transmitter that's in the field, you replace it with the new sensor, you put the old sensor back in the box, and you send the new sensor back to us. We get it back, we clean it, we recondition it, we calibrate it, and we store it in our, our walk-in freezer refrigerator uh, where it does a very good job of prolonging the life of the sensor. So not only is it calibrated to our ISO standards, it's also then stored in a controlled environment, which does uh, pr prolong the life of the sensor. Some customers, you know, they're storing them in their shop. They're exposed to the target gases. They're exposed to moisture. And they're exposed to heat. All those things will degrade your sensor over time and will will shorten the life of the sensor. So it's important to, to store these in a dry, cool area. And that's what we do for you at the factory as well as do the, the calibration. So it takes a lot of the guesswork out of your calibration program, uh, puts it all on us to, to remind you that it's due. Uh, and then, and then, like I said, you can access all that calibration data on the ASI and the Sense Alarm Plus uh, right from the uh, transmitter. Uh, and we also give you a calibration certificate that comes with it. Besides that, we are uh, our factory does have personnel for doing startup and commissioning. Uh, the beauty of startup commissioning, if you had a project or even you know a few sensors you installed, we'll come out and do the startup, the commissioning. And while we're there, we'll train your facility staff to do um, to do their own calibrations if that's what you wanted to do, or how to maintenance the the transmitters. Um, you know, you just tell us what you know, level of training you need. We'll provide that for you on site while we're doing the startup and commissioning. Uh, and then also, um, we also have uh, contract calibration maintenance that we do as well, where our guys will just come out on a regular basis and do uh, do the calibration and maintenance. So. We are a full service manufacturer and um, can provide you with the highest level you need or just the parts you need to do you, do it yourself. Um, any discussion on that? That's kind of the end of my presentation. I hope uh, you know everybody got some uh, information out of this. This was um, useful. And uh, anything, any questions out of there, Ryan? Yeah, we do have a couple more questions here, Todd. Um, so this one goes back to the scrubber application and uh, the question is, what is the maximum sensor range you have for, for H2S? Maximum range of H2S. Stand by one second. I will give you that here. It's 100 ppm. I, I can answer for you. So. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Ryan's yeah. been doing this for many more years than me, so he's got a lot of, uh, a lot of experience in these water wastewater applications. But yeah, it's 100 ppm. Yeah, so so uh, to answer that question fully, Brian, 100 ppm is the max for H2S. Um, in many cases, you'll see folks, uh, they always monitor the outlet of the scrubber. Um, I don't always see them monitor the inlet of the scrubber, basically because you know there's always H2S there. And uh, because there's always H2S there, it will shorten the life of that sensor. But if you want to know exactly what it is on the inlet and the outlet, um, you know, you would have to put one on both in both spots, and that that kind of leads to um, Todd. You're you're probably checking that in the in the catalog right now. We have we have a reference in the back of our catalog that shows um, the most common sensor types we have, what the ranges are, and it also shows things like the time weighted average, short term exposure limit, and whether the gas is heavier or lighter than air. So it will help you in determining, you know, proper sensor placement and and what sensor options are available to you. Yeah, we we have all the different gases listed. As, as Ryan said, we've got the density of the gases, um, the time weighted average. So if you're you're trying to follow an OSHA standard, we give you the information. The uh, immediate danger to life and health, uh, the IDLH, which means if you were to walk into an environment and be immediately dangerous to your health, uh, we list those. All that's in this very simple and easy to use chart. 
uh, that we can either send you or um, or it comes with our catalog. So another question, Todd, is is regarding uh, sensor life. Uh, you know, you mentioned where how you want to store the sensors in in a refrigerated environment, if possible. But what sort of uh, expected sensor life do you get? Both if you are storing the sensors, you know, just just stocking them, versus if they're installed in a in an application. Yeah. So again, that's very subjective to the um, to the environment that the sensor is exposed to. Um, but I can give you a kind of a um, an idea when when we have a sensor let's try and like a cl2 uh, sensor our sensor spec sheets do list a um expected life uh, life expectancy if you will expected life on this sensor is three years from shipping date and that of course is in an optimal controlled environment um it's not going to be exposed to the target gas it's not going to be exposed to meat moisture it's going to be in a refrigerated um a dry controlled environment so we do tell you what the expected life is of the, of the sensor when it's shipped, um, but it is very subjective to the environment that it's installed in. And then to, to kind of further on that, you know, you can use that sensor life remaining um, in, in the menu structure to, to get an idea of how much longer that sensor will last you. And, and if you're doing your own calibrations, that's a really good thing to add to your calibration procedure is to record that value. And that way you can see, you know, say you're doing quarterly calibrations, you can get an idea of, of how much that sensor life is decreasing per quarter. And then it'll it'll kind of alert you once you get below a certain value, you know, it might be a good time to get a new sensor on order so you don't run into a situation where you don't have a, a working sensor. Yes. And I think that's pretty much it for uh for questions, Todd. That should cover everything. Right. Well, thank you all very much for uh, spending some time with us this morning. I appreciate it. And uh, if there's any follow-up questions or anything, please get with Ryan or myself, um, and we'd be happy to answer them. If you want us to come out and, and look at some applications, um, we're available for that as well. But uh, other than that, have a great day. Stay safe, and uh, appreciate it. Have a great rest of your week. All right. Thanks for doing this, Todd, and thanks, everybody, for attending.